Okay. All right, so mostly we're going to talk about swimming injuries and prevention, which means we're going to talk about the shoulder, because, well, that's the biggest thing swimmers do. Um, if anybody wants to talk more about elbow and back, which are the next two most common swimming injuries, I will be happy to, but I did not tailor the talk to that. So, Okay, so first, 90% of the complaints in swimming do have something to do with the shoulder. Um, depending on what study you look at and who you talk to, it can be up to 80% of swimmers will complain about shoulder pain, and most elite level swimmers will have shoulder pain. I remember when I was swimming, you know, it was not uncommon to see eight or ten people get out of the pool, put ice bags on their shoulders, and sit there for the next 20 minutes. And that's very common. When we actually start looking at the real statistics, though, and now we're primarily looking at age group senior national teams, 47% of age group swimmers complain about shoulder pain. Think about that. That's half of them. And that's just the age group kids. And when you get up to the senior national teams, you're talking about three quarters of them. And when you start looking at pain that limits training at a national level, you're talking about a quarter of the people involved in this. So it's a big deal. And we have to figure out why that is and where this is coming from. So most NCAA teams, if we look at big, big time Division I schools, will swim upwards of 12,000 to 20,000 yards a day. And that's just huge. Um, when, I, when I was swimming, it was, and I was in a fairly competitive high school when I did not compete in college, I only competed swimming in, in high school. But it wasn't unusual for us to do 10, 12,000 yards a day at all. And I mean, we commonly did that. And um, you know, you're talking about some of these teams doing 20 plus thousand yards, and that's just huge. When you start converting that into running per day, just to give you some kind of frame of reference to what that means, if somebody's swimming 15,000 yards a day, that's the equivalent of running about 34 miles a day. There are only two groups of people that I know can do that, and maybe Carrie and Shane can correct me. But there's a group of Indians in the Andes Mountains who do this routinely, and some of the Kenyans do. And that's it. And most of the rest of us are not built to do this kind of thing. And swimming, unlike running, is not necessarily a native activity. Now, if you saw me run, you would say it's not a native activity, uh, but that's a different story. So, um, And also, most, most elite swimmers do train six to seven days per week. So you're talking about a lot of training here. Now, this one happens to be an MRI of a shoulder. And if we look, this is your arm bone here. This is the top of your acromioclavicular joint, which is right here. And this bit of white coming through here is a tear and tendinosis of the supraspinatus tendon, okay? And that's what we com most commonly see in swimmers, okay? You don't need to know how to read an MRI, but I just wanted you to have some idea. Um, the most common complaints that swimmers have from a diagnostic standpoint is rotator cuff tendonitis and impingement syndromes, which are the most common cause of shoulder pain across the country for all of us. But in swimmers, it becomes a bigger deal. <clears throat> most elite level swimmers, I shouldn't say most, there's a lot of debate on this right now. In some of the papers I've been reading, leave me going, really? What group of elite level swimmers were you studying? Um, but that they uh, had a lot of labral tears, and long term, people like me who have been swimming a little too long start to develop arthritic change in the joint because of it. Um, and then there's the ever famous swimmer shoulders, which <clears throat> is basically, you're a swimmer and your shoulder hurts and don't talk to me again about it. Um, and that's what I found when in sports medicine, um, <clears throat> most sports medicine doctors hate swimmers because they don't understand the sport, they all complain about the same thing, and they can't figure out what to do about it. And so when I was at the University of Toledo and said, oh yeah, send the swimmers to me, they were like, really? You want them? Yes, yes, I want them. Okay, you can have them all. So I did. I got them all. So <clears throat> in the end, the reason why most swimmers have shoulder pain has to do with stability or instability of the shoulder joint itself. Okay. <clears throat> Most elite level swimmers, and the reason I'm, I'm hedging when I say this is there was just a paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine last month saying that instability is not that big a deal, and that's the one that left me going, really, what group of swimmers did you study? Um, <clears throat> but most swimmers have increased <clears throat> shoulder range of motion, and they need that to be able to swim effectively and to be effective and talented. 
because of that, not, not because of the, along with that, excuse me, they also have increased internal rotation in their shoulder, because when you put your arm in, you tend to do it like that, and so you have to be able to internally rotate your shoulder. And they have a huge amount of adduction strength. Now, what we mean by that is an ability to pull <coughs> your arm this way from here in and down. And in sports medicine, we all call that adduction, which is just this movement. Um, so anyhow, um, <clears throat> we'll leave it at that. Okay. Now, one of the problems in an unstable shoulder is that it can do what's happening here, where it subluxes. <clears throat> and so what this is, is this is my thumb on this girl's shoulder, and I pulled her arm down, and my thumb sinks down into her shoulder because I actually pulled it out of joint. Now, if you do this to me, you can actually dislocate both of my shoulders on physical exam. And it doesn't hurt. I prefer you not do it, but, but it doesn't really hurt to do it. But you have to be able to put it back in if you do it. So um, you will have swimmers, especially ones who have been swimming a long time, and until this happened to me, I didn't really get what they were saying. So yeah, you know, I, I dove in the water. I went to pull my arm, and nothing happened. So I pulled harder. And all of a sudden, it went thunk. And it's like, oh, my God. Did you stop and get out of the water? No, I kept swimming. And then it happened to me, and I did the very same thing. And I'm swimming, going, how stupid is this? Um, and what happened is it actually popped out of joint. Because when, when they dove in the water, and the water hits here and pulls up, the shoulder popped out this way. And when they went to pull, nothing happened because their muscle didn't want to pull it. So they pulled harder, and when it did, it slid back into place. But it had gotten hung up on the edge of the shoulder blade, where the, the articulation is. So that's not that uncommon a complaint in a lot of elite level swimmers, but it really means that they have a really sloppy shoulder, okay? Um, when we look at what the shoulder's designed to do and what our rotator cuff is designed to do, we think about the rotator cuff as moving our shoulder, and it really doesn't. Things like our, our deltoid, our lats, our pecs, they're the things that move our arm, okay? What the rotator cuff does is it tries to keep this bone snug up against the, um, we call it the glenoid, which is the, do we have a skeleton in here? I'll show you it later. So, um, <clears throat> but the rotator cuff is supposed to keep the head of our humerus up against the glenoid so that it stays a nice, smooth, and tight arc the whole time. When the, sh when the rotator cuff can't do that anymore, the head of that humerus starts to slide around. And because it tends to work so hard to try to do that, it tends to start to thicken and stuff, and that's where we start to see a lot of the problems we have in the shoulder. But the whole key is what the rotator cuff is trying to do is maintain the stability of the joint. Okay, here we go. I, I have pictures of the shoulder. I forgot. So, <clears throat> so what we're talking about is this is your shoulder blade, okay? Here's your arm bone. And the humerus, which is the name of this, articulates with the head of this area is called the glenoid here. These are some of the ligaments that hold this in place, and these are the ligaments that actually get loose and stretched out. And then the rotator cuff has to work a lot harder to be able to hold that thing in place, okay? So now this picture is with all the muscles put on, okay? So you kind of have an idea of what it is you're looking at. And so now what I did was we x-rayed through the deltoid muscle so that we can see underneath it. And so now you're starting to see the beginning of the rotator cuff in here. And if we turn this so we look at it on the side, which are these pictures, this is now what we're seeing. Okay, so here's our arm bone coming up. This is our AC joint right up here. Okay, and between the arm bone and the AC joint, we have this great big bursa. And there might be two there, but sometimes there's just one big one. And when people get an impingement syndrome, what that is is a pinching of the structures between your humerus and the underside of your AC joint. And the biggest thing that gets pinched is that bursa. And so as it tries to move, it just grinds it right up against the other side of the bone. It hurts a lot, okay? If any of you decide you want to hang wallpaper one day, and you hang it all day long, and the next day you go, man, my shoulder hurts, I can't reach back, I can't, that's an impingement syndrome, okay? The other one that, it, that people come to see me is they paint it all day. And, you know, did this for eight hours, and then they wonder why their shoulder hurt the next day. My son actually got this playing the Wii. He's eight years old. 
He comes in and goes, Dad, my shoulder really hurts. And I'm like, really? Why would that be? And my daughter comes up and running up and who's seven and says, because he's been playing that stupid Wii all day long. And so, but that's another one that people don't think about that can do this. So, now, if we take this bursa off and we look underneath it, so this is the outline of the bursa. Here is the rotator cuff all along here, okay? And if you notice, it makes a ring all the way around the shoulder here. And what it's designed for is to be able to have a basically global control to keep that bone snug up inside that joint. And in swimmers, what happens is they eventually start to lose that. And that's where their shoulder pain comes from. The first thing that happens is they fatigue. They get tired. And as they start to get tired, they tend not to, their, their rotator cuff muscles aren't quite contracting as well as they should. And so that thing starts to move. And then when it starts to move, it starts to get irritated. So they contract a little harder. In the long run, the one that tends to, to take the most brunt is this one, which is called your supraspinatus. And this is the one that is you're bringing your arm up and around as you swim. It's the one that's really um, holding it in place as you're bringing it up this way. And then the other ones start to do from the underneath part. But because of that overhand motion, they, it really works. And as it works, it starts to get thicker, okay? And as it gets thicker, it starts to lessen the amount of room in this place between the AC joint and the humerus. And so when you start to, to lessen that room up, you're more prone to getting that pinching that occurs, okay? Now, why does that happen? Well, one, you're swimming too much, okay? When we start looking at swimmers and why they have this is kind of a really complicated slide describing how it actually works. I'm going to skip it if you guys don't mind. If you want me to talk about it, I will. But I don't think it's going to benefit this group all that much. <clears throat> so let's look at the mechanics of swimming. What are we really doing? Okay. So when you're swimming and you're going along like this, your hand gets in the water and it catches the water. Okay. The next thing is that you really we used to think, if anybody's read any of the old thoughts, especially by a guy named Councilman, old Doc Councilman was the coach at Indiana. He was Mark Spitz's coach. Um, and he was the guru of swimming. And what he did is he took a lot of underwater film of Mark Spitz and tried to figure out what's really happening from the best swimmer <coughs> that had ever lived at that point. And what he thought Spitz was doing was taking his hand in the water and coming out and in and down and back. And so what he was really doing was tracing a propeller, he thought. Okay? And so for years, people said that. And then they decided, hmm, maybe we should look at this again. And it turns out that's not at all what's happening. The only reason the hand moves is because the body's moving around it. But what's really happening is you get your hand, it gets caught in the water up here, and then you pull your body over top of your hand. Okay? except that the water moves a little bit, so it gives, okay? But that's really what you're doing. And it doesn't matter what stroke you're doing. That's essentially what you're doing. If you're doing breaststroke, so you're here, and you're sculling, you're using, you're using the sculling motion to throw your hand to find dead water the whole time, and you're pulling your body over top of it. If you're doing butterfly, you're doing the same thing, and you're pulling your body over top of it, okay? So that's the first part. The second part is, what are your feet doing? Okay. Well, your feet are actually providing a propulsive motion, but that has to do much more like a dolphin, where the kicking and a flutter kick is like this, so you'd have you know, two fins of a dolphin. In butterfly, it's very obviously a dolphin. Uh, breaststroke is more of a frog, and that's how a frog moves. The same kind of motion, though, and your feet are swinging back in there. What's really happening is the, the frog is pushing his feet so that it propels him forward, so that it's, it's like being on a wall and you're pushing forward on it. Okay? So that's, again, very similar to, I would liken <clears throat> your arms to climbing and your legs to pushing, except in the case of flutter kick and, and uh, the butterfly kick, which are really much more of the traditional how an, an aquatic animal swims. Okay, <clears throat> now in freestyle and backstroke, we're not tugboats. We're more, ideally when you're swimming, you're more of like a battleship. And a battleship has got a big V in the front of it so that it slices through the water. 
And when you're swimming, <coughs> freestyle or backstroke, that's what you want to be doing so that your body is rolling like this the whole time so that it's doing this. And so at any given time, it's slicing through the water like this, not like a tugboat like this. Now, butterfly and breaststroke, on the other hand, would normally look more like the tugboat. And yet, they're not. The thing about them is, they're both undulating. And so what they're really doing is swimming the way a dolphin swims. And so in a butterfly, again, it's, it's much more obvious that you've got somebody coming like this, and so as, as their hands go in and the butt comes up, it's actually going like this, and like this, and like this. And that's what's really happening. Now in breaststroke, for years, the rule was the head couldn't go underwater, okay? Which meant that they had to be a tugboat, which meant that swimming breaststroke was far and away the slowest stroke. And then, boy, it's probably been 15 years now, might, might be longer. Um, they changed the rule and they said the head can go underwater. And now what you see is these breaststrokers coming way up here, their hands coming out of the water, and they're diving down. And they're doing the same thing butterfly is, they're doing this, okay? And that undulation actually is propulsive, okay? The same way a dolphin is. Okay, so why does this subluxation occur, okay? If I put my hand in the water, and it catches here, and I contract and pull my hand down, ideally, my body's going to get pulled this way. What actually starts to happen as the rotator cuff fatigues is the arm, the body doesn't get pulled, the shoulder gets pulled forward, okay? Because the big muscles back here, which are moving the arm, start to contract and start to move it, but the rotator cuff can't do it, so it actually pulls it forward out of, out of socket, for instance, okay? That's really problematic, um, and it hurts a lot. If, if it truly slides out, baseball players do the same thing. If you watch a fatigued pitcher and he starts to lose his pitch, what's happening is he can't control the end range anymore and his shoulder's starting to slide forward and they just fall apart at that point. And hopefully a good coach takes them out before that. And so we have pitch counts in Little League. Unfortunately, we don't have swim counts in swimmers. And we have to come back to that. So um, The major muscles that we use in swimming are lats and pecs. And far and away it's our lats. I mean, you've all seen, you know, Michael Phelps, you know, big wings underneath his arms. Um, the pecs get used a lot as well, not quite as much as the lats. And the deltoid gets used a lot because that's the biggest one we're using as we bring the arm forward again, okay? <clears throat> as those things, well, I've already said that, so we'll skip that. I want to make sure I mention it. Oh yeah, swimmers, if we look at them, have, if you look at the adduction strength, the ability to take the arm here and pull down like this, in a swimmer versus a non-swimmer is just a huge difference. And, and we're talking about um, your regular person who's had some amount of athletic training when they did that study. But it's a very big difference in the amount of strength. That, and it has nothing to do with lifting weights. It has much more to do um, with how they're trained. We'll leave it at that. So. Okay. Now, as they fatigue more, and as the swimmer is going along and you get late in practice, well, what happens? Well, one, the shoulders start to get tired because that's the major thing pulling things. But the other thing is, any of you guys coach swimming ever? Have you ever I mean, you, you've got your kids. You sit, sit in there and watch them swim. Have you ever been there late in the practice compared to how they are at the beginning? You notice they're not doing this anymore. They're kind of doing this, and they're more like a tugboat again. Well, think about that. If you're doing freestyle, and you're doing freestyle like a tugboat, so you're here, and you're doing this, how much force does that put on the shoulder joint itself now? Because now the shoulder, it's not your body roll. When your body is rolling, look how high my shoulders come up out of the water. And we'll see some pictures in a minute of some um, more elite swimmers and how much their body's rolling. Well, if you're three hours into a practice, your legs are tired, your back is tired, you're not doing any of those things, so you're doing this. And now your shoulder's taking all that brunt, and so it's just sloppy all over the place. The rotator cuff's overworking, and that leads to this whole cascade. Okay, so now this is Natalie Coughlin, okay? And if you know swimming, Natalie Coughlin is one of our most decorated swimmers of all time. And look at her body here, okay? So she has gone and done this. 
Okay, and she's letting her body roll and reach so that this is how she's almost straight up and down in the water. And you see how much her hips have rolled along with it? And that's very important. That's the way it's supposed to. So if she can't do that, then her shoulder's got to do that work for it. Now this is Dara Torres. And look at where her arm is and where her body is. Her body is almost completely perpendicular. Her head is almost in alignment with her body. So it's not even her neck that's doing all the turning. We have a tendency to think that the neck has to turn all this way. It doesn't. It's not supposed to. And, and if it does, then it starts to create a lot of problems more with the neck. The whole body is supposed to be able to turn to make that breathe so that you're not putting that kind of torque on your neck. Okay? Now, a recent study suggested that it doesn't matter what stroke you do. It has to do with how much time and how much distance you actually swim. I don't believe that for a minute. Um, if any of us have done butterfly, you know that butterfly is a whole lot harder on your shoulders than freestyle is. What's interesting is it doesn't matter if you're doing backstroke or freestyle, because both of them have similar motions, but they're going opposite one another. Both of them apply very similar, like in backstroke, your hand is going to go in here and your body is going to turn and pull this way and down, and you're doing this the whole time. And so this arm is supposed to get really deep here. Well, in catching up here and pulling down, this position of the shoulder puts a lot of strain on the rotator cuff again. So backstroke's actually harder on your shoulder than freestyle is. Now, it's not to say that you shouldn't switch your strokes around. You should. But you have to realize that freestyle is the most efficient way to swim. Everything else after that is worse. In butterfly and breast, when you do breaststroke, you're bringing your arms here like this. Well, this is also a lot of strain on your shoulder as well. That's not as much as butterfly is. Because, again, you're not coming up way up here like this. So. All right. So, treatment. What do we do? One of the problems with treating shoulder pain in swimmers is by the time you start to treat, it's too late. Okay. Um, when I was in Toledo, I had a 12-year-old girl who, and she was a very elite level 12-year-old, who came with shoulder pain, and her mother's response to me at the very beginning was, whatever she wants to do is okay with us, we just want her to get better, and so on and so forth. So I examined her, she's got a multi-directional instability, she's got rotator cuff tendonitis, and she's 12. Okay, she doesn't have her growth plates closed yet. So, well, the first thing we need to do is keep you out of the water for probably at least a month. And mom wigged out, just wigged out. And I was like, really? I mean, she's your kid, she's 12. She's like, well, this is such an important time of year, and da 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 da. I'm like, no, it's not. We're not even close to the important time of the year. Well, we have this meet and this meet. And I said, you know what, if you want to swim this meet and this meet, right off the rest of her career, because by the time we get to summer, she ain't going to be able to do anything. And so you almost have to take them out. And I hate to say that, but you've got to give the rotator cuff time to heal. And, you get all, and then you have to retrain it. And that's the important part. Physical therapy is probably the single most important part of getting shoulders better in swimmers. And there's so much involved in how you do that and, and the right way and the wrong way to so often, I, and I'm not plugging this because Carrie and Shane and Lance are here, um, but when I send people to physical therapy, and this was much worse in Ohio, I really wanted to know the therapist I was sending them to so I knew what they were going to do. Here, where I don't know as many therapists out in town, I really encourage people to come here because I know what they're going to do and I know they're going to do it right. I don't have to worry about it. Um, if you're going to take them and do a bunch of ultrasound and stuff like that, you're going to waste their time. You've got to retrain the system. It's got a really bad habit, and you've got to train it back into a better habit again. So, and the vast majority of what is under that is what's important. Now, you can do something called prolotherapy, which is to design to tighten up a joint. If the, if the ligaments inside that joint are really that loose, then maybe you need to get them tightened up. Worst case is surgery. And no, unlike in baseball, no elite level swimmer has ever come back from a major shoulder surgery to compete at a high level again. They've been able to swim again, but they've never been able to compete again. 
you know, we can take baseball players in the major leagues, do, do the fancy name for this is a capsulorophy. You do a capsulorophy and they might come back and pitch again. No swimmer has ever done it, not to compete at that level. So, so yes, by the time we treat them, it's way too late. This is again Vera Torres, <coughs> and, and again, look at her body mechanics. You know, even though this arm is stretched out all the way in front of her, her body is almost completely turned still, and this arm is, is just starting to come out of the water here. So it's got more turn left in it, okay? The other thing is she's actually in a glide right there, okay? So when that arm goes in, she's gliding this out. And it's not going to start the pull here. This arm is going to start to sink on its own. And once it sinks down here, now you've got some mechanical advantage in your shoulder, and then it's going to start to pull. But that glide is really important. And even when they're sprinting, and, and Dara's one of the, the best people to watch. If you can get some film of her swimming in the Olympics and watch, even though she's sprinting, there's that just hesitation of a, of a before it starts that allows her hand to catch the water. Other than the fact that she's beautiful, I do love this woman. I met her when I was 21 or 22, and, and Dara, I don't know if you've ever seen Dara Torres, she's like six feet tall. She looks like she could break me in half without thinking twice about it. Um, but she was one of the nicest people I'd ever met, and, and so she's always stuck out in my head. Okay, so how do we prevent this? Now this one is Amanda Beard. Now Amanda Beard is a breaststroker, and Boy, she went to the first, her first Olympic Games and won when she was 14. And I don't know if there aren't too many, I'm sorry, agent here. Do you remember the girl who carried the great big giant stuffed animal up to the podium with her? That was Amanda Beard when she was 14. Um, Amanda Beard is in her late 20s now, and she is training for the next Olympic Games again. Um, but she is, this is that, that breaststroke that I was telling you about that comes up and out and down. And that's what she's doing. Um, the most important thing that contributes to swimmer's problems is time and distance. So if you're not a very fast swimmer and you spend three hours in the pool, it's not that dissimilar to a very fast swimmer spending three hours in the pool who might go two or three times as far. Going two or three times as far is much worse in that time frame, relatively. But relative to the nature of the individual, they're not that dissimilar to each other, okay? The other thing is you have to look at fatigue. And when I coach swimming, um, it started with the, the first team I coached, we only had an hour and a half of pool time. And so I had to figure out how can we get the most amount of work done in an hour and a half. And when I first started, I was thinking distance, distance. We've got to get at least six or 7,000 yards in an hour and a half. And it became very apparent that you can't do that and not get effective training. And so what I started to do was, um, and there was a coach in Canada at the time, and I can't remember his name. I, I want to say it was McCall. Um, but I'd met him at a conference, and, and he'd given a presentation on, on short distance swimming. And he, a lot of his swimmers, he would only swim for like 3,000 yards a day. But he would do 3,000 yards at about a 90% of max rate with lots of rest. And his, his reasoning was that if you look at a swimming stroke and you compare a racing stroke versus a practice stroke, okay, so if somebody's going to swim a 100-yard freestyle, and you think about what does the stroke look like through three hours of practice. Well, it's kind of like looking at somebody running a 100-yard dash versus running five miles. The strides aren't the same. The mechanics aren't the same. And it might even be worse because it might not be that they're running five miles. It might be that they're jogging five miles. And jogging is a very inefficient gait as opposed to running, which is a very efficient gait. But think about the difference between somebody sprinting and running or somebody who's racing five miles versus somebody who's just going out to run five miles. Think about the efficiency in the gait and how different it is. The same thing's true in swimming. Only in swimming, you're doing these insane things like swimming 12, 15,000 yards a day. Okay? So imagine now you've trained yourself to swim this distance every day, all day long, 
and you've just trained a very inefficient gait, and you wonder why your shoulders hurt. Okay, well, the same thing would be true if you were a runner, okay? So, <clears throat> if you do the same stroke over and over, that probably contributes to it. Um, I've known a couple people who have swam five and 6,000 yards of butterfly a day, and it's really hard on your shoulders. And by the way, no study ever tests anybody doing that. Um, the other one is, a lot of times we come up with these drills that are supposed to be make you better and make you stronger, and they are the worst idea you could have ever come up with, and we'll get to those. What not to do? Well, number one is what Amanda Beard is doing right there, okay? Hand pads. They are one of the single worst things you could possibly do for your shoulder. Why is that? Well, one, look at the size of her hand, and look at the size of that paddle. Now, in doing that, the idea in using this paddle is to make yourself stronger. I have more resistance in the water. I'm going to pull myself better. Well, what you really did was now you put your hand in, and you went to pull, and now you have this great big thing here that does not let your hand move at all. So what's going to happen? You're going to yank your shoulder up this way, and that's what happens. When I was competing, we would very often do about 1,500 yards three or four times a week of hand paddles on the idea that you're making your shoulders stronger. And you're not. Hand paddles are just horrendous. And we've known this for 20 years. And if anybody's interested in how to train a swimmer, there's a book by a guy named Ernie Magliccio. Um, the original one was Swimming Faster. The second edition was Swimming Even Faster. And I don't remember the name of the third edition, but it actually is one of the best books ever written on swimming and how to train, what you're training, and why you do things and why you don't do things. And he was saying in the first edition, get rid of the hand paddles. They're the worst thing we've ever come up with. So hand paddles are number one. Now what else do we use, use with hand paddles? Pull boys. You know those things you put between your legs? Well, what's the problem with that? Well, I don't want to kick. I just want my arms to work. Yeah. You can't roll anymore, yes. So the combination of a hand paddle and a pull boy is like the worst thing you could possibly do. And it, it's just too hard on your shoulders. And so get rid of it. Move on. What's interesting is if you really want to train speed and contraction, then you need to allow the muscle to contract faster than it normally could. And the way to do that, if you really want to build speed and power, is you have them sprint with flippers on. And you let the flippers do the work so that the flipper is actually what's driving them through the water, so that now they are actually able to contract their shoulder faster without having that kind of strain on it, and it actually trains speed and power in it. So that's actually safer and more efficient than any of these other things, okay? Now, I put this picture of Dara Torres in here, and I don't know if any of you saw before the last Olympic. Do you guys know who Dara Torres is? I keep talking about her. Okay, good. All right. Um, I don't know if any of you saw any of the film of her training. She did, she only swam about 2,000 yards a day, and all the rest of, now she trained about eight hours a day, okay, but all the rest of her training was on land. Now, in this case, what we're showing here is she's got weights in her hands. So she's trying to mimic to some degree what it's like to move through the water, but she's not doing this to make her shoulders stronger. She's doing this because she's on a ball. It helps if I point up here. She's on a ball, and she's training her core. And she did some of the most amazing things with her core that I've ever seen anybody do, gymnasts or anybody else. And she's a 40-year-old, 6-foot-tall swimmer doing this. And it was stunning what she was able to do. Um, and her flexibility at her age, now she had people who stretched her for an hour every day. And, but she can take lying on her back with one leg flat and lay the other leg up here above her head. And that's amazing at her age. And, and given her sport that doesn't necessarily value that kind of a thing. The reason she was successful when I'm trying to get at why I put her in here is because she spent so much time 
training her core, and that's still what we swim with, not with our shoulders, that that's what I think made her so successful. And I do not believe that she was doing steroids or anything else. Um, people can argue that, but having seen her over her entire career, she isn't that much different than she ever was, as opposed to um, our famous pitcher, um, Plummer. Yes, who got bigger as he got to 40. So, and stronger. Sam, so, yeah. the other thing you have to know when you're swimming is when to stop. Now, this is Natalie Coughlin again, and I just wanted to have a picture to show backstroke. And again, look at how much she's turning her body. And that's, the, that's such an important part. So, when do you stop? Well, you stop when you can't maintain your stroke mechanics anymore. Would you keep running? I wish I had a film of me running, and I would say, if you ran like this, would you tell anybody to keep going? Okay, you wouldn't. I really, my my college roommates were track, were all in track, and I was the only swimmer. And they watched me run one day, and they're like, my God, it looks like a toad on two legs, <laughs> and and it really does. Um, <laughs> I can't run worth anything. Um, so, but the point is that if you start to see the stroke fall apart it's time to stop. You don't keep going. It's not like I'm going to get two more bench presses out of this and get better for it. Once you start to lose the mechanics, now you're training bad mechanics. And you're putting more stress on the joints again. And you don't want to do that. So one of the things, and this is really hard in swimming, is because usually you've got one or two coaches and you've got a pool of 30 or 40 kids. And you got to watch them all and actually start to pick out when it's time to get out. Now the problem with that is that you also have the kids who just don't want to work that hard. And so how do you do that? So that's a judgment call. But if you're dealing with elite level kids who really want to train, you have to know when to tell them it's time to stop training that day. Because otherwise you're just going to train more bad habits and put more force on them. Um, back when I was swimming, um, so this is when I was at Kenyon. Um, LSU had become a national powerhouse in swimming. And if, if you know anything about swimming now, they're not really. And they haven't been for 20 years. But they had one coach there who decided that, you know what, this 15,000 yards a day swimming is crazy. And he trained his kids 6,000 yards a day. And that was it. And that was his limit. They said, I'm not doing more than that. He trained stroke mechanics. He's trained power, and he trained speed. And he won the NCAAs two out of three years in a row before he took a job at Kenyon as the athletic director. His kids were had the best starts, the best turns, the best stroke mechanics, and he won the NCAAs doing that. Now, the only thing that he didn't win was the mile, 1,500, or in the NCAAs at 1,650. It's the only event he didn't have somebody place in the top three. Because that one you might need to train the distance now. But you don't need to do 15,000 yards to do it. I mean, how many of you who run marathons train a marathon distance every time you train? You don't do that. You don't have to. Your body can take the next step on its own. The same is true if you're swimming. So, now we have backstrokers again. The other thing I wanted to point out is... Do you see how much their bodies are curving in the water? Okay. This is how a fish swims. Okay, fish and dolphins don't swim the same way. A fish swims like this. Well, we're undulating. Backstroke is the one we do this the most in, but you do it to some degree in freestyle too. That undulation side to side is actually also very important to swimming. That's how a snake swims in the water. Okay. Um, so again, when you start to lose these secondary things that may be more primary than we think, then your joints start to have to take the brunt of it. And they're not meant to do that. And that's when it's time to stop. And so, if, since you guys are mostly triathletes, if we're looking at you guys swimming, when do you quit? You design your workout not to go a certain distance. You design your workout to achieve a certain goal that day. What part of your physiology are you trying to train? Okay. And if, and if you're just starting, what you need to train are stroke mechanics. You don't need to train distance. You, don't need, you need to be efficient in the water. That's what you have to train. And 
figure out how do I train that efficiency? How do I teach myself to be better in the water? And even, even at my point, um, and, and don't take this as me bragging when I'm swimming, like some mornings when I'm swimming at the Y, um, you know, I've had lifeguards come up to me afterwards going, I just love watching you swim. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I'm not that fast anymore. My shoulders can't take this anymore. Because like, it's so beautiful. Your stroke is so effortless. And, and it is, because I've been doing it a long time. And thankfully, when I was coming up, I had a, um, my age group coach was my high school coach, who was the guy I started coaching with, um, was, and, and I can now probably say he is the winningest high school coach in America ever. Um, and uh, anyhow, he just started coaching again at 70. Um, he got dragged back into it again. And, um, but he was so firm on teaching stroke mechanics. And because of that, you know, even long after I left him, you, you can feel what your stroke is doing. You know how to modify your stroke. And it becomes more and more efficient. Now, when you're swimming, or training, excuse me, and you can't maintain that anymore, it's time to stop. You're not helping yourself anymore. It's time to be done for that day and move on. What that also means is it's a lot easier to train at a sprint than it is to train at a distance. Okay? So there was a guy, again, the Canadians do some interesting things. <coughs> um, and for somebody who's not a powerhouse in swimming, it's kind of surprising. But there was one of the Canadian guys in Montreal who said, you know what, I don't believe any of this. I think we could train, and he was taking masters on swimmers for this. I'm going to take one group of people, and I'm going to train them the same way I always have. And I'm going to t take this other group, and they're going to do 60, 25s, as hard as they can, on a minute. That's it. They're not going to do anything else. That's what they're going to do every day. So that's what he did. And so six weeks later, he does goes through their time trials again, and he had them swim um, 100 freestyle, a 200 freestyle, and a 1500 freestyle. And he compared their times, training the traditional way. So you got one group going 1500 meters a day, and you've got this other group going six to 8,000 yards or meters a day, because it's meters up there. And the group that he trained with 1500 doing essentially 60 one minute sprints um, actually beat all of the people had a bigger drop in time. They, they had a bigger drop in time, number one, but they also went faster than the other group did in the second part. And he said, screw this, I'm treating, I'm training everybody like this from now on. And he did. The advantage in that is that, number one, first of all, he found out that you actually can't go 60 right off the bat. You had to start a little slower. Um, because what happens is they start to fatigue out and they can't do 60 of these in a row. So it takes a lot of time to build up the endurance to be able to do that. But once they got there, it was very easy to maintain it. And, and if you did that all day, every day, you get kind of bored. So you got to switch things around a little bit too. But um, he found that by, so what he would do is he would vary his distances between 25 meters and typically 100 or 200 was about as far as he would have people go. But he would do them at a very fast pace, so about 90% of their max pace, and then give them, if you're doing a 25, figure that they're going to go between 10 and 12 seconds for a 25, so if you're going to do them on a minute, you got about 50 seconds to rest. So you're getting a good amount of rest in there. If you're going to do that with 100 and do that to do 100 meters, you probably are going to do them on about four minutes. So they might be coming in at around a minute, and they're going to rest three minutes before the next one. And even then, that can be really rough. So, um, and then you have to think about ages and stuff that you're training. Because I've noticed as I get older, I can't do anywhere near some of the things I used to be able to do. Like, I don't like maintaining my heart rate at 190 anymore. Um, my body just doesn't like that anymore. So, but that way of training trains a better stroke. It trains more power and speed. It trains the aerobic side, okay, because actually a lot of the aerobic stuff actually happens in the rest intervals then. And if you get into the, some of the physiology behind swimming, you'll understand why that is. Um, and it's easier on the shoulder. And the other thing he noticed after he started doing this for a couple of years is his complaints about shoulder pain started to go down. And so he was very excited about that. So 
You gotta know when to quit your training that day too. And then that one, I just love that picture. That's Michael Phelps again. And that's just, that's an awesome picture. So I just love that one.